you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Mark's Gospel, the 8th chapter. I want you to find verse 27. That is where we closed out last Lord's Day. And I want to read down to the end of the chapter. And uh, this is some of the radical, most radical preaching and demands you'll ever hear Jesus make. I want us to begin reading in this and let us contemplate this, these great verses and this great truth that is ever before us. Mark chapter 8 verse 27 says, And Jesus went out and His disciples in the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, He asked His disciples, saying unto them, Who do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist but some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man. And that's very interesting. That Christ would tell them, Don't y'all tell them I'm the Christ just yet. Verse, verse 31. He began to teach them, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. <laughs> but when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And that's our problem sometimes. We, we don't understand the things of God. And we say, oh, this can't be. But that's exactly what God's will is. And God has to get a hold of us. Look at verse 34. This is the radical claim and the call that Jesus makes to the world. And when He had called the people unto him with his disciples also you got to understand at this point Jesus has been performing miracles doing miraculous things and now this great big crowd of people has gathered together and he calls that people unto him and he makes sure the disciples are included that's what the text says and this is what he said to them whosoever will come after me let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Huh? So if you're going to follow Jesus, and if you're even going to come to Jesus, what does Jesus put before them? And He says to these people that are apparently quote-unquote following Him, he says, if you want to come after me, what, what, what are you going to have to do? Deny yourself. Take up a cross. And follow me. Here in the West, the cross has become nothing more than an ornament. It's something we wear around our neck as a charm on a necklace. Earrings, piece of jewelry, some wall fixture. But what Jesus is saying, the cross that I'm going to bear for the sins of humanity, right? the cross that I'm going to bear, you're going to share with me in that because those of you that will come to me, you're going to have a cross you're going to have to bear. A cross is an instrument of death. Jesus is making this radical claim, if you're going to be one of my children, and you're really going to be a follower of me, you're going to have to say no to you. You're going to have to die to you and what you want. You're going to have to do that by taking up a cross in order to follow me. Jesus does everything every seminary teaches preachers not to do in preaching to the crowd. Amen. Every Bible college, Bible 
They said, man, if you got a crowd like this, you don't want to preach nothing like this. But every time Jesus gets a crowd, he loves them enough to tell them the truth. I'm just telling you, it's amazing to me that Jesus does right things right the opposite of the way we think they ought to be done. And Jesus, man, this now is time to encourage these people. No, Jesus tell them, this is what's separating you from whether you're going to heaven or whether you're going to hell. This is what I'm requiring of you. This is what it means to be saved. This is what it means to be quote unquote a Christian. Because by the way, we use that term Christian very loosely. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. See, disciples existed before the world ever started calling the disciples Christians. What is a disciple? It is a follower, a student of Jesus Christ. Somebody that was willing to learn and follow and submit to Jesus' Lordship. Okay? That's what it means to be saved. Okay? Jesus didn't save you so all your dreams and hopes can come true. Jesus saved you by His grace and for His glory. It's not that we were, and we'll go to first, uh, Philippians chapter uh, 4, verse 13 and say, well, I can do all things through Christ Jesus which strengthens me as we're trying to use Jesus to let Jesus be part of our dreams coming true. Listen, when I come to Jesus Christ and you came to Jesus Christ, our dreams, our desires, our wishes got put on the back burner because Jesus didn't say to give me a better life. He saved me to save me from this world, to save me from my sins, to save me from the wrath of Almighty God. And now I'm going to spend my days as Jesus did on the earth, not doing my will, but the will of Him that saved me. Amen. That's what it means to be saved. This false gospel that's being preached and pumped and primed in America is sending good, quote-unquote, people straight to hell because they're trying to use Jesus as a genie in a bottle or a crutch or a way to make it in this life without doing what God wants of us. I mean, you think about what Jesus is saying here. If you are going to come after me, you know what I'm you're going to be a follower of me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Why? Because you can't follow Jesus when you're doing what you want to do. The last days are characterized by people being lovers of their own selves and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Every day in my early days of my Christian life, Luke 9, 23 was shared in my heart. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And every day my prayer has been, Lord, help me because I need help to deny myself. I need help to take up that cross daily. And I need help following you because I can't do this on my own. We are no match for you. We're no match for the world. We're no match for sin. We're no match for Satan. And I'm telling you, we're being pulled at all different angles of our life. And if we are not constantly being recognized and realized, we do not exist for ourselves. We exist for God. Amen. And it is a struggle every day for me to say no to me and yes to Jesus. And if I'm going to be a true follower of Jesus, this is what Jesus demands. And listen, he goes on from his demands that he gives this description of what it looks like. Listen to verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Are you trying to save your life? What does that even mean? Are you trying to save your own reputation? Are you trying to save your image? If you are trying in any shape, form, or fashion to make yourself look better to the world's standards, you are trying to save your life. 
And Jesus is saying, if you're doing that, guess what? You're going to lose it. That's what he says. And he says, whoever, whosoever shall lose his life for my name's sake and the gospel's sake, the same shall save him. So Jesus is teaching this paradox. In order to be saved, you've got to lose the present life you have. And be willing to give up your life for Jesus' sake and the gospel's sake. So what Jesus is teaching, that those that deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me, they're willing to die for Jesus' sake and the gospel's sake. Like our forefathers did. They were hung, they were beaten, they were disemboweled while alive, they were burned at the stake. Yes. They were martyred for the cause of Christ. And Je listen, Jesus is putting out some radical claims that if we issue these claims today, there's not many people willing to do this. Scared, plumb to death of what a man or a government or some pope or some potentate could possibly do to you. And Jesus teaches in the New Testament, don't fear what man can do to you. Fear God who can destroy both body and soul and in hell. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And Jesus has to make this claim. If you're too busy trying to save your life, you're going to lose it. But whoever's willing to count the cost for my name's sake and the gospel's, the same shall save. How much have we suffered because we took a stand for Jesus and the gospel's sake? How much persecution have we faced because we wouldn't go along to get along? Right? We took the stand. We spoke up and we spoke out. And we may have lost family members over it. We may have lost friendships over it. We may have even lost promotions in the workplace because of our faith in God. Are you willing to stand with God and His gospel over what this world has to offer? Because this is what Jesus is teaching. And if you're not willing to take a stand and to speak up for God and His gospel sake, He says you're going to lose your life. It is evidence you've not yet been born again. You don't have the Holy Spirit within you to do what I am requiring of my people. These are requirements, by the way. This is what it looks like Jesus is saying to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. This is so much different than if you'll walk the aisle, pray the prayer, sign the card, and get baptized kind of message than what Jesus preaches here. I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to go the way Jesus preached. Amen. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters. Listen to what else he says. And I'm going to make an application and try to de deal with this. He says here in verse 36, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So what advantage, what benefit if we live for ourselves and what the world has to offer and if we could accomplish everything this world puts stock and value in, right? That's what Jesus is saying. If you gain all that, what good is that when it comes time to die and you don't have me and you lose your soul? It's absolutely worthless. So this asks the question, who and what am I living for? Verse 37. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So what will a man be willing to do and to get and attain in this life 
in exchange for his eternal destiny. Fortune? Fame? What? Any of that? They're doing it every day. Verse 38. For whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Do you see it? The generation Jesus is bad. It's adulterous and it's sinful and it's only magnified since then. The word ashamed here means to be scared. To be cowardly. To hear it, not stand up or speak up. To be ashamed is embarrassed. It means to not receive it means to reject. So Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me and what? My words. He links himself with his words. Right? We know who God is based on the Bible. So if we're ashamed of who Jesus is and what his word says, in this adulterous and sinful generation, meaning we've got to take a stand for who Jesus is and what he has said, right? Regardless of how bad the generation is. How wicked it is. And he says, if you are ashamed of me, he says, of him shall also the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father and with his holy angels. Now, I really want to emphasize mainly verse 34 because that is the whole thrust of all this as it is set before us. And I want to do this by way of an illustration real quickly. Does anybody know what a bandwagon fan is? Anybody know what a bandwagon fan is? It's going good, you jump on. It's like a bunch of Alabama fans right now, okay? Now that Daddy Saban's gone, they jump and shift. Because it ain't what they used to be. Like the old gray mayor ain't what she used to be. Well, old Alabama ain't what she used to be. And they jump and ship. Well, this is what's happening. Up to this point, Jesus has done a lot of good and things that everybody likes. And now Jesus has thrown a wrench in it by putting on these quote-unquote high ridiculous demands. Okay? That they're not going to go along with and so they're fixing to jump ship. So the question this morning is, are you a fan of Jesus? Or are you a follower of Jesus? Do you know the difference between a bandwagon fan and a true fan and follower of a team? A true fan and follower of a team stands with them whether they win or lose. Regardless of how bad the season is. Sort of like our Mississippi State fans. It's bad. Boy, they're holding on. There's hope. We got next year, they say. There's a lot of people like that in the church. As long as the church's going good and the preaching's going good, hallelujah. But you let this hard preaching come in that Jesus is now doing. Mm -mm, I didn't sign up for all this. Oh, no, that, that's just ridiculous. I think Jesus was a little off that day when he got. No, Jesus never was off. So the question is, are you truly a follower? This is called for us to examine ourselves this morning. This is called for me and you to have a reality check and look closely into the mirror because as a lot of people say they're saved and are a follower of Jesus, but they don't even know anything about verse 35. Amen. And according to Jesus, this is what he can make. In discipleship. I mean, if you read Luke chapter number 9, verse 57, come follow. He says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but I, the Son of Man, have nowhere to lay my hand. He said, Lord, we'll follow you wherever. And he said, I ain't even got nowhere to go. And he says, You take up the cross and follow me. And he says, Man, I just bought a yoke of oxen. I need to go try my yoke of oxen, and then I'll follow you. And then he went to a man and he says, Hey, listen. 
You, you let the dead bury the dead, but you come and follow me. And what he was saying is my father's about to die, and I can't follow you till I get him buried. And Jesus said, you ain't got all that. You need to let the dead bury the dead. You need to follow me. And then he goes down and says, I done married a wife, and I can't leave. And so he's the hen pet man, and he won't leave because he got buried. Right? And then there's somebody so I got a piece of land I got to go see after. And Jesus says, you need to follow me. And this is what Jesus said. No man having taken hold of the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. So there's so many people got a foothold in the church and a foothold in the world. And you're really a fan of Jesus. And you're all for him as long as everything is good. But you let the sun go behind the cloud. You let bad news visit you. And the shout you had when the sun is shining is far and gone. Now the things have taken a turn for the worse. And it's proven you're really not a follower. You're just a fan. We got too many fans in the church that's here for entertainment. And not enough followers involved in the work of the local church and helping the world get to Jesus. Because we're not willing to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow Him. And these are things Jesus demands. And I want to talk about these radical demands of Jesus in the next few moments that we have together in this service. And He says in verse 34, look with me. And when He had called the people unto Him with His disciples also, He said unto them, Listen to what he said. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let's just break this down phrase by phrase. He says, if you're going to come after me, what if you're going to come out, follow after somebody? It means you're going to go to them. You're going to go, not only go to them, but you're going to go with them. You are going to follow the leader, right? Jesus is Lord, isn't that right? He's got the authority. He's got the ability to lead us. And we have every right to submit and surrender to the claims of His Lordship. Jesus would say to the people, He said, y'all draw nigh to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Why do y'all call me Lord and you do not the things that I say? If you're not going to follow me, you can't call me Lord because I'm not your Lord because you're too busy doing you. You're too busy doing your own thing. Seeking your own ways, your own means to get things done. You don't even think about me. You don't even pray about me. You don't even ask me what my will is before you make decisions in your life, okay? This is where Jesus is getting at, okay? We, yeah, we're grown folks. We can make our decisions, but buddy, if you belong to the Lord, you best be seeking what God wants. It ain't about us just do whatever we want to do and say hopefully Jesus will work it out in the end. No, it's you seeking God. It's you being in a relationship because we belong to God because He's bought and paid for us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says we're not our own. We've been bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and spirit which are the Lord's. Right? It ain't my body, my choice. The Lord owns it. I got what I got because of Him. He created me. I didn't create myself. He saved me. I didn't save myself. And now that He saved me, I'm indebted to live for Him and to live for His plan, live for His purpose, to live for His glory because He's been too good to us not to. Come after me. There's one thing about Jesus and His demands of coming after Him, according to John chapter number 6, in verse 37, listen to what the Bible says. You can flip over there. We're going to read several verses in John's Gospel in chapter number 6. The first thing, if you're going to come to Jesus, number one, you must be drawn by the Holy Ghost. There's no human being that wakes up one morning of his own volition and his own will without the divine intervention of the Holy Spirit. God is the initiator. 
No man just says, well, I'm going to follow Jesus today unless something first happens. And this is what Jesus says happens. John chapter 6, verse 37. Here's the promise. All that the Father giveth me shall what? Come to me. So here the idea is God the Father has given Jesus the whosoevers that believe in this world. Amen. And because they've been given by the Father to the Son, the promise is they shall come to me. Amen. And that's the sovereignty of God in this thing. But here's the responsibility of man. All that come unto me. Hallelujah. I will in no wise cast out. Jesus says, if you'll come to me, I'm not turning you away. Amen. 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 That's hope. If you want Him, come. Because the Holy Ghost has done something and He's changed your want to. Come. If any man hear His voice, say come. Look down in verse 44 of John chapter number 6. Jesus says this, No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. And, hallelujah, I will raise him up the last day. Woo. You get this idea that everybody that truly comes to Jesus has been drawn by the Father. They were drawn because they were first given to the Son before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. And because a moment in time, God dealt with you. You came to Jesus and the drawing power is enough to assure and secure your salvation in so much that you've been drawn, you've been delivered, you've been saved. He says, I'm going to raise you up to the last day. Now what did you do? What did God do? No wonder we preach by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory be to God. It's time we quit trying to play God and the Holy Ghost and get unripe fruit down here. And let God do what He's going to do. Amen. Let me tell y'all something, church. God is so wonderful and so magnificent that He has promised the guaranteed success of the church and the gospel outreach. All that the Father give me, they're going to come to me. And all that do come, I'm not going to turn them away. Glory to God. The very fact that you came is a direct result you were given to the Son before the world ever began. And, and hallelujah, thank God, a moment in time He drew you to Jesus and just so happened Jesus was right where you were. Hey, listen to verse number 63 of John 6. He said, it's the Spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Like that. The flesh profits Let's just have a let's have a reality check this morning. The Bible says, Galatians chapter six, verse number three. Let a man take heed when he thinks he's something, when he is nothing, lest he fall. So number one, we are nothing without God. My flesh, what I can do in my body profits me what? It's the spirit in us that's making some benefit. This flesh, this body profits nothing. Because, number one, we're nothing without God. John chapter 3 verse 27 tells us that no man can receive anything except it be given him of heaven. So what does that mean? Not only does it mean that without God I am nothing, without God I have nothing. Amen. John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me you can do what? Nothing. So the Bible teaches us that number one, without God we are nothing. 
Number two, without God we have nothing. And number three, without God we can do nothing. Boy, we ought to just have a spell and rejoice a little while. Look at what all God's done for us. Look at what He does for every little thing we're afforded to do in this life and have and enjoy. It's come by His good hand. See, that's a whole different view than the American way of thinking. Self-made, self-reliant, self-sustaining, self-sufficient, yet self-deceived. And you self-destruct. We got people think they're making it without God. We got people thinking they're making it without grace. We got people thinking, look at what I've done in my life. It's all about me. It's all about I. Number one, that is sure sign you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Because what's the first thing you got to do? Deny yourself. Why must I deny myself? God says we are Why live your life in your own strength, in your own power, your own plans, only to lose your soul at the end of life when you know we are nothing, have nothing, and can do nothing without God? John 6, 65 said, and he said, Therefore I say it unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him by my Father. In other words, you must be given permission to come. You don't get saved whenever you want to. You get saved when the Holy Ghost is dealing, convicting, calling, drawing, working in your life. Period. In order to come after Jesus, you must be drawn by the Father. Second thing, he says, you must deny yourself. That's hard, isn't it? That's very hard. You think about all the desires we have. Think about our appetites. You think you strong-willed? Buy a bag of Lay's potato chips. Their old saying, you said, bet you can't just eat one. Can you just eat one and put the bag up? You get what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, all we have to do is go look in the mirror and most of us can tell. You know, we got self-control issues. You know why? Because we don't like to deny ourselves. We ought to stop at one piece of pie, but we go back and eat half the pie. We ought to stop at one plate, but we went back for the second. And if we're that way with food, what else do we not have any control over in our spiritual life? If we can't even control our physical life, how in the world do you think we're controlling our spiritual life? This is why Jesus says you've got to die. Deny yourself. In so much so, in third world countries right now, they're being arrested and being killed for being Christian. And you know what they've got to do in order to get out of it? Renounce their faith in Jesus. And you can live. I wonder if that happened in America. How many of us would just tell the government whatever they wanted just to save our own life? And how many would renounce Christ? This is why he says, if you're really my follower, you've got to learn how to deny yourself as I can do by going to the cross. This is real biblical Christianity. I didn't write the book. He did. This is foreign language to us, isn't it? Do 
deny myself? You mean to Oh no, preacher, you, you don't see all my faith with athletes. They got Bible verses under their eyes. They're, they're making it big and they're using Jesus as a crutch to do so. Saying that but it's something wrong with that picture of sending out the wrong message. If you just be a little Christian, he put Bible verses on you, I look what God will do for you. It may not be the case for you. Hmm? Jesus does not exist for us. I mean, we do. We exist for him. That's what I'm trying to tell us. Jesus is not our genie in the bottle that America has made him to be. He said, you want to be my true disciple. We have to deny ourselves and not be ashamed of him and his words and be willing to lose our life for his name's sake and the gospel's sake. That's what it means to be saved. And if we don't have that, we need to wake up and we need to repent and come running to Jesus. Amen. Because according to Jesus, this is what he demands. Oh yes, it's still by faith alone because faith without works is what? Dead. This is what faith produces. Me to be able to look death in the face and say, It is well with my soul. It is for me to say, I will not bend, I will not bow. We will do what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did in the fiery furnace. It will be what David did in the lion's den. And now you, sir. Then he says, You need to take up your cross. Why? Why must I die to myself? Because as long as the old you is alive and well, you'll never be to where God wants you to be. Amen. Paul said this in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me gave himself for you. Are you crucified with me? Is, is it not you living in you, but it's Christ living in you, and the life that you're living is by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you? Paul would make this great claim. It's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Let me, let me just get there just for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Paul would say this, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto the death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul would say, I die daily. And he says, wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, I'm bearing the dying of the Lord Jesus in me. Why? That Jesus might be made manifest in my life. We exist to be His light bearers. We exist to be His ambassadors. We exist for this world to be able to look at our lives because we have denied ourselves. We have taken up that cross and we're following Jesus that... Jesus is being manifested in our lives. And then he says, follow me. You and me, in order to follow somebody else, must be willing to give up control of our own life. Because we're not in control anyway. We think we are. And we must follow Jesus. Do you know what God's will is for your life? What did God save you for? What's your purpose? Why has God left you here? What are you doing with the time Jesus has given you? I, I can think of a lot of applications. How do I know the will of God for my life? Reading the Bible. Amen. How do I know what God wants me to do? Reading the Bible. 
Solomon said much study is a weariness to the bone. Now these Sunday school teachers can tell you that sometimes the body don't want to do it. But guess what? Sunday's coming and it's your time to teach. And what do you got to do? Deny yourself. Take up that cross. Get in the book. What, what do we do? It takes a lot of work to be a Christian. We don't work to be saved, but later we work to know Him better. What well, Paul said, work out your own salvation. What well, God works in you need to work out. How many times have you read that book? Come and come. How much scripture have you memorized? People say, well, I wish I I wish I could remember like some people. You can. Get the book. Renew your mind. You know how you do it? Constantly over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You keep reading it, rereading it, writing it out, read it again, read it again, read it again. We just lazy. That's the facts. Me included. We'd much rather somebody give it to us. How many of y'all guys like to sit back and somebody feeds you but you ain't even got to pick your hand up? Every day, every time I'm hungry, somebody like a little baby. Like Anna, take that bottle in the mouth. The more she's satisfied. There comes a time you've got to learn how to feed yourself. And if you're going to grow as a Christian, let me tell you something. It's going to call you to deny yourself. Take up that cross. Crucify that flesh. And our laziness, and our bad attitudes, our bad desires, all that. We've got to crucify that in order to follow Jesus. Paul would say this, Romans 8, 8, and I'm done. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. So in other words, if you're in the Spirit, you have the Spirit of God, you can please God. But if all you got is the flesh and you're doing everything you can do, in your own strength, your own power, not seeking the counsel or direction of God, you cannot please God. What do we need to do? We need to repent. We need to come to Christ. So let's stand to our feet. Father, we love You. We thank You, Lord, for the day. God, I pray You'll take Your Word now and let it find a way to find a lodging place in our hearts and lives. God, shine the light of the, Your Word into our hearts and lives this morning. Uh, God, help us to repent of our laziness, our idleness, our complacency, uh, God, our just our, our, our lack of desire to know you better and to know your word more. Forgive us where we failed thee, God. And I pray you'd work in our lives to let this be a reality for us of what it means to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ and help us be a real follower, not just a fan. And God will give you glory for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we wait in silence this morning.